And I want to pose that firstly, not to Airbnb, because I know what you're going to say. Uh, I want to pose basically to Dr. Robert Yap. What would be your response? Well, I think um, <clears throat> everything is about resources and, and efficiency. Ultimately, many of us duplicate a lot of things. All right? Many of us have uh, assets that are too many, or we want something that we are short of. Uh, the matching process of having access resources to, to needs and demand, I think this is a key to the shared economy. Um, it, in the business that I'm in, actually, I run what we call the third-party logistics operation. So we, we take over the entire complexity of running a supply chain from companies like Dell Computers. Right? We run their supply chain to fulfill, basically, all their back-end manufacturing and then take the products out and then deliver it out to omni-channel, whether it's the stores or even to your home, where it's a direct uh, uh, consumer. So you have all this kind of thing, but when we build solutions over the years, this solution becomes very much best in class. At the same time, this solution becomes something that can be shared. So in our case, uh, we have Y3 Technology Group. So today, we have a Y3 Technology Group that's actually going around putting solutions on the cloud. So it's a bit uh, in terms of sharing that. Uh, so instead of uh, a company that needs a solution that can pay a million dollars, we actually hope to actually have a million people using the, the solution for $100. So that's a kind of a concept. And that concept, I think, is a very interesting concept because it actually helped to level playing field, right? So we have the micro SMEs, the small SMEs that are there trying to fight in a marketplace where they are big domination by big boys, which have advantages of building solutions, investment, that is very difficult. It's almost like we're all fighting bare hand. If we go and fight bare hand, maybe we have a good chance of winning. But you will fight against somebody who has a special weapon, a machine gun, which you cannot afford or you don't have. I think that's a disadvantage. So how do we then allow the younger, the, 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 the smaller SMEs to be able to have cheap access, easy access to such shared solutions that can bring them up and compete on a fairer level. I think these are the kind of things that is very interesting and, and what we are doing in terms of mentorship and so on. So the question in this is, are companies prepared to put a solution? And today, the technology is there. The cloud services, you can deliver all these solutions, share it, and everybody pay as you use, but having a workout solution for a song and then allowing people to grow and grow inclusively. I think this is some kind of thing that will actually end up to be a win-win for everybody. I think that's a very good segue, Robert. Your, your statement basically is that the shared economy is just not about assets, for example, what Airbnb does, but also in cloud computing, cloud services, software as a service as well. Uh, that's also a shared economy. I think the former president alluded to that very powerfully this morning as well. She talked about the shared services, whether it's BPO, call center management, or you know, financial and accounting services in here. That's also a shared economy that can transpose and be transversal across the economy and even cross-border in here. So Mario, let me pose the same question to you as as a person who influences policy, do you believe that the shared economy right now is something that's real, sustainable, or you think it's just a uh, fad? No, I think that if we look back at the functioning of the economy, we have been for uh, centuries confronted with the issue of commons. And actually, a recent Nobel Prize won the Nobel Prize because of the work on commons. There are some collective goods that needs to be built in order for the economy to function. And the sharing economy is in part providing an economic model that make it possible. So uh, I think this is not a question of the future, it's just how do we recognize a deep functioning of the economy. Let's uh, take the first video that was so interesting. The co one of the comparative advantages of Airbnb is the fact that people want to be inserted in the local. It's very interesting, you have nomadic people, by definition, tourists, that want to be sedentary. And what does it mean? It means that the, the local economy is something more than the sum of the economic actor of the services that they provide. It's what in Japanese you call fudo, is the strange atmosphere that is typical of a place. How can you preserve that atmosphere? That's the issue that the sharing economy is trying to address. Now, how much is going to develop in the future? I share a lot of the point that was just made. We are confronted with many of the challenges that are related with the dissemination of digitalization and the consequences of digitalization. Negative, in certain cases, we know that in Asian 
in the ASEAN territory, we have countries with completely different rate of penetration of the new technologies, and therefore, how do we guarantee an inclusive spread of this new uh, mechanism? But on the other hand, there could be also some threat, uh, some advantages. And the advantages come from the fact that you have few more people that can insert officially the economy. Are we ready to recognize it? I think that there are a lot of issues for policymakers here. For example, how do we guarantee a system of protection? What we are assisting in many cases now in developing countries to the so-called new middle classes. But at the same time, we have people that have left extreme poverty and are scared to fall back. In fact, they don't have pensions. Many work in the informal economy. When they retire, they fall back or they don't have a system of health in place. So if somebody got sick, then you fall back in extreme poverty. This um, double dimension, expectation that comes from the fact that you have improved your condition, but on the other hand, the threat that you can lose that condition create tension that we see politically appearing in many developing countries. That's for me one of the threats. How do we solve that problem? So, so let me take a segue on that, and, and, and Robin, I'm going to pose a question to you, and it's not about finding what your financial budget targets are going to be for next year, okay? But essentially what I'm going to ask you is this, is that you're going to make such a big impact in a shared economy as far as hospitality is concerned, right? Do you believe that over the next five years, how big is that impact on hospitality? Yeah, so this is a great question. I think that uh, that's something that we're seeing already happening, so whether or not it's five years out or today, uh, we're seeing a huge increase in digital, internet, mobile, uh, mobile usage, social media, and it's happening here in the ASEAN member economies. So whether or not we're ready for it, it's already happening. Um, yes, we do see a big impact coming in five years, and I'll tell you why. So as of today, we already see a huge impact. Let me take it from the APEC level first. So from the APEC level, we're seeing about 20.7 million inbound arrivals. That's international tourists coming into the ASEAN member economies. The economic output that has been put out by the usage of Airbnb from these tourists who are coming in is about $28 billion, and that's generated about 370,000 jobs across 116 APEC cities. Okay. After that, we're seeing about $8 million generated in income for hosts who are providing their accommodations on this platform. So that's incredible already at the APEC level. Let's look at ASEAN communities. So we've seen about 4.4 million arrivals to date in the ASEAN uh, markets. And in the top markets, so that would be like Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And Philippines doesn't trail too far behind. We've seen a very high level of um, output from there as well. And in fact, we've seen over about $292 million generated in income. So if this impact is already happening with very uh, limited support or innovation spurred, you can only imagine if we invest in this technology in the shared economy, how much further we can go. So yes, I do see that there'll be great impact. So shared economy is pervasive. We talk about the fact that it covers not just industry verticals, it cuts across basically technology like cloud computing and even shared services in terms of the way to do back of the house operations in here. So I'm gonna pose a question back to you, Robert, again. Do you think ASEAN is ready for shared economy? Or are we some ways off from that? Well, I think uh, ASEAN being um, the way ASEAN is, well, we are very disparate in terms of uh, level of economic uh, progress. But at the same time, I think it's exactly because of that that we should actually leverage on the shared economy model. I mean, a lot of things that are being done, for example, uh, in Singapore, we do a lot of smart city solutions here and there. Can we use that as an example to look at a sharing? That means every city in ASEAN doesn't have to go through its own learning curve. Can we leapfrog? Can we look at it? I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, value in it, but how is that going to be done? I think is what something like an ASEAN, even the ASEAN Business Advisory Council could be actually facilitating. So it's very important. For example, in Laos Connect that we're trying to do, right? In Laos Connect, it's actually about ultimately bringing up and sharing, shoring up the case for all the small, medium enterprises. Imagine today goods were to flow in everywhere. The bigger companies have big advantage because they could ship container loads. So if you have a few 
cartons or a few pallets that you want to send from one end to another end. For example, you want to send to Cambodia, you want to send to Thailand, for example, from China or anywhere. All right. uh, how are you going to do that? All right. uh, firstly, you will go through many, many steps before you actually get the goods delivered and you probably pay a lot for it. So the whole idea of Alas Point is to create ultimately also a system that allow anybody to book for that. So if you have cargo that's going in, it's almost like your Airbnb, right? So if I have a cargo that I've 10 cartons, 50 cartons, I can't afford to charter a truck. I put it up and say, okay, I want to move this cargo from here, let's say to Cambodia. How do I do that? Okay, so there'll be various code. And the code will come in, or you're going to pay $500, ringgit, or whatever it is on that. And then, the, but if you have no urgency, you want to say, take it at your own time, but in a week, in two weeks, you don't have to do it in three days, for example, you probably only pay $100. $150. So that will actually level the playing field because smaller companies can do their bit size in terms of looking in economies, the way that we do business so that we have the economies without having to pay excessively for the inefficiency. And then when that happens, I think more of the small companies will be able to compete and they'll be able to move up the value chain. So there's an interesting point and, and I think what Robert is actually bringing up is interesting because he's saying that the shared economy is also potentially raising productivity, competitiveness, and cost effectiveness right now across the region in here. So at this point, what I'd like to do is kind of like reach out to the audience and say, get your questions ready because I will set aside about seven to 10 minutes for you to do a Q&A on us. And uh, feel free to ask anybody on the panel as well as the moderator. But uh, let me ask you, uh, Mario, from an OECD lenses in here, what do you think? Do you think ASEAN is ready for a shared economy? Excuse me? Yes, it is. Uh, what I tried to say before is that we always had component of a shared economy in our societies. Now technology make it much more um, at, at hand for many things. And Asia has the same characteristics that we see in many other countries. Now the limit come from technology. This would be my point of view. In order to have a shared economy, you need to have alphabetization to the use of technologies and the possibility to see, to, to have access to the technology. If you don't have this condition, then you don't share anything. Then you continue to have private appropriation of certain specific public goods. And then you have business as usual. If you want to guarantee that platform, that alphabetization, then you need investment and you need policies in this respect. Obviously education, but also you need to have the access to the web, access to internet, and this is not equal in Singapore as opposed to uh, Cambodia, for example. And therefore, how do we guarantee that these mechanisms are in place? Why? Somebody may think, why don't we go alone, country by country? Yes, but in fact, there is a critical mass component. You need to have over border relationship for these things to function. You saw people come into Paris, they don't come from France to use Airbnb. They come from Europe, maybe from other continents. The same needs to be put in place here. And in order to do that, you need a series of policies. Not only policies to facilitate the consumer in the connection with these new technologies, but also foreign direct investment that allow a certain spillover in this respect, you need investment from the national government in infrastructure that are particularly needed. And the substitution of public-private public partnership can function, but let's be frank, not for everything. And as a consequence, there are many actions that need to be put in place. The demand, the possibility, the basis is for Southeast Asia as it is for Latin America or North Atlantic. But the policy, they will make the difference. Thank you for that. So Robin, I'm going to pose the same question to you. Do you think ASEAN is ready for a shared economy from the Airbnb lenses? So I'm going to be a little provocative here. I'll say it's not a question if we're ready. I think it's a statement that we need to be ready. There's nothing we could do about it other than to embrace and spur it. And I think it's exciting to do this because let's look at a couple of the trends. So we're seeing rapid urbanization. If we even look here in the Philippines, you can see more and more people are moving to cities. We're seeing a larger gap between urban and rural areas. So we need to bridge that gap. 
We're seeing a growing middle class, a burgeoning uh, economy where they need to generate income to live their lives. We're seeing increased media consumption. I mentioned earlier, digital, social, internet. All that's happening, but especially happening here in ASEAN areas. So whether we want to or not, we have to be ready in order to grow the economy and meet the objective um, for ASEAN, which is to bring in 800 million guests uh, by the year of 2025. And so I think it's really exciting if we can have that mindset that these SMEs and startups and uh, partners want to spur this type of innovation in the shared economy. Okay, so the questions are going to be a little tougher uh, because I think you know one of the things that we don't want to do is drink from the Kool-Aid that we all believe in a shared economy. So I'm going to pose you a provocative question in here. Are there risks involved in a shared economy? Are there going to be disadvantages that we can look towards in a shared economy? And what are the things that we can do to mitigate that? So uh, I don't think the answer is no. There must be some weakness in there. I want to tap on your expertise and your knowledge. And even if you have a conviction, please share with us. So this time around, I'm going to go the reverse because let's tap on Airbnb first because you are drinking from the Kool-Aid and nothing works better than to hear, is there some weaknesses, disadvantages that we should be aware of? Not necessarily from Airbnb, but also the wider thing that we talked about, shared services, cloud services, et cetera. Robin. Yeah. Is this what I get for kicking the case study off? I get to go. Okay, uh, so let me first share about some of the challenges. And I'm a firm believer that challenges bring on opportunities. So with the shared economy in general, I think that it's a new mindset. It's a new way of working. It's a new way of living. So no longer is it all about just ownership. In fact, if you look at surveys, we see the majority of people when asked if you could spend your time and money on either life experiences and events or owning something, what would you want? And the majority say that they would rather invest in some sort of experience or event. So that's going to be a mindset change. I think this also requires partnering very well with lo local authorities and governments. I mean, we can't do this without local governments, and it's very important to do it on a city by city, county by county, country by country level. And so the importance of partnership and understanding how to build a smart, uh, fair regulatory framework where it allows people to engage in the shared economy um, in a very free yet regulated way, I think that's incredibly important. And we've been studying this with over 300 jurisdictions um, around the world, so that's from the Airbnb side. And then I would say last but not least, um, from the challenge side, it's a, not a place for hate. So by definition, shared means sharing, you know, being able to utilize the same resource or access something um, across with someone else, right? And so Airbnb and other platforms have actually taken a stance on like anti-discrimination and not having any tolerance for hate on the platform. And so I think that's going to be another mindset change. On the opportunities, there's plenty. I'll just name one, right? So I think that we have increased access to things that you wouldn't normally have access to. You get to experience things that you wouldn't normally get to also experience. And I think that's going to be incredibly powerful for all ASEAN member communities uh, going forward as we want to increase tourism and grow in a healthy, sustainable way. Okay, so Robert, I'm going to pose a question to you as well, but with a little skew onto it because you mentioned that a shared economy, there is an upside in terms of productivity, efficiency, cost effectiveness. Let's talk about risk, shared economy in ASEAN. What do you think are some of the risks that we may be confronted with? Uh, <clears throat> there are always risks in many things. Uh, I'm, I'm an optimistic person, that's why risk and challenges become something uh, that I find difficulty answering. Because... Uh, you want to pass on this? To me, everything is a challenge and everything can be overcome. I guess the, the principle, I think, of the whole thing is very important. So government has to facilitate that. Uh, at the same time, I think domain, all right? So everybody think tech, but tech is not really the everything that you, that you actually have and magic will happen. Ultimately, it's the domain, all right? So domain, in any businesses or in any processes is very important. And then the tech come in, enable that domain to make sure that it is then available to everyone. Right? So that's a part of thing that a lot of people don't understand. So a lot of startups go in and just say, I have this tech, I have this tech, but then what are you doing? So the domain, the purpose, and how you're going to achieve that is very critical. So at the end of the day, when we actually put on a soft shared economy solution, 
uh, it could be obviously open to abuse because there could be people who are very strong in lobbying things or people who are very rich in whatever thing that they can do and they will just pump basically a project. But the project may not be the best project or the most efficient for the economy or for the people. So you have that kind of issue, right? So then you push it in and somehow it is very hard for the ordinary uh, SMEs or people below to be discerning to know what is really good and what is best in class and what is not. So you could be going in and subscribing to a shared economy solution, thinking that you are part of the beneficially, actually you'd be sub short change, right? You could have actually gone somewhere and then one upon 10, you could have got nine, but then when you actually do on this platform, you only get five upon 10. So these are the kind of things that we have to be wary about. How to do that? How do we actually look at these pitfalls? I think government and also basically through conferences like this, through platform like this where we interact, we share. And everybody will then make its best call to get the best shared solution that we all think that we could actually make use of for everybody's advantage. Sure. Mario, please. Yes. Um, first, I see three issues. The first is what I was trying to communicate before, which is the fact that if shared economy will not deliver on expectation, then you can create a series of frustration. This means that if countries in ASEAN, for example, develop with different speeds in the absorption of this opportunity, this create, will create tension. But also, let's think to small and medium-sized firms. All these technological innovations that made share economy so spread uh, facilitate the entering in business of small-scale investments. Uh, is it going to take place? I mean, technologically, you can. But therefore, if we do not support the SMEs to exploit their possibilities, this will also create tension. This is my first point. The second point has to deal with what we listen on the newspaper. Let me be frank, London is forbidding Uber. And you had a series of tension in the United States, in Europe, and in many other countries. So it's not a matter, is it there going to be a tension? It's already there. And what are the major issues behind? I see two behind there. First, the issue of taxes. How do you tax these activities? Because you have changed completely the, may, the way of doing business, and therefore the traditional system of taxes will not be available, and consequently the government will not be capable to do the investment that are so required for the sustainability of this activity. And second, I was mentioning before, all the tension with Uber is mainly related to the social protection that before was paid by taxi driver on their wage and on the profit of the company that was hiring them. This mechanism doesn't function anymore. So we have a social contract of the past that is not functioning anymore today. Does it mean that we have to cancel the hypothesis of the shared economy? The opposite. We have to figure out what are the new tools to be used in order to guarantee that taxes are paid as they should and that people, workers in particular, can do a decent job. Thank you. So I've got two more questions to go and uh, then we're going to basically break into um, the red alert is out. We've got eight minutes in there. But, you know, there are a lot of MSMEs represented here in this room. So in 30 seconds, what would be your advice to the audience who could be from MSME in terms of preparedness as they move towards a shared economy? 30 seconds, beginning with Robert. Okay, I think uh, shared economy is something that's, uh, that is happening, all right? Um, so it is for us to really embrace and look at how we can uh, maximize, right? Uh, the way that we take advantage of sub-shared economy solutions. I think it's very important for us to do that, um, to think that way. At the same time, be cognizant. There are a lot of, uh, what do you call that, startups and all that, they will come in many things, all right? And then when they start to grow, everybody's putting money on it. What we are afraid is that money is put on certain things and draw everything, but ultimately could not deliver what it is. And then we get caught, right, in trying to actually use that particular solution or service. I think it's something that we just have to be cognizant, but, but it got to be there, so selecting the right uh, kind of a solution, putting our money in the right place, and ensuring that we can all make use of the whole ecosystem that's being created for better efficiency, so that we could share in a win-win and win kind of a situation. Okay. Mario? 
facilitate regulation, provide the basic infrastructure that are required, and then solve the problem of the social contract. Fantastic. Robin, from an Airbnb subject matter expert. Or Kool-Aid drinker, is that what you were saying earlier? Uh, so from my perspective, in just 30 seconds, I think uh, let's figure out a way to embrace and spur innovation, right? So what we're seeing at Airbnb, for instance, uh, providing opportunities for innovative tourism uh, projects is incredibly important for this type of sector. Uh, just last week, our co-founder, Nate, went to Da Nang and announced a $2 million fund that will be available through 2020 for ASEAN to come up with innovative tourism projects. So this will allow some lightweight way uh, for startups, or partners, SMEs to come up with ideas for resolving this tourism gap. And then also, there's ways to partner with other types of organizations, and that's what I would encourage with SMEs. For instance, in India, we partnered with Sewa, which is the Self-Employed Women Association for over two million women who can become hosts and generate income, and they predominantly live in rural areas. So if we can get creative in resolving and solving for these types of problems, I think that we'll see that growth is inevitable. Okay, so the last question from, from me, and then we're gonna open up to the floor. We gotta talk about jobs, the future of work, the future of jobs. With the shared economy right now, which I believe and I share your convictions in terms of it inundating ASEAN, you know, even now, and it's going to basically take a lot more acceleration and intensity over the next three to five years. In your personal opinion and in your experience, what jobs do you think are at risk and what jobs do you think could emerge and what jobs do you think may be altered as a result of the shared economy? And this time around, I'm not going to post names. Who would like to go first? Yep, I can leave No, no, no. Oh, as you prefer. Uh, okay, Mario. As you prefer. But um, first, I think uh, possibility of access to activities. Um, second, valorization of assets that are present are immaterial and are not considered as such. Uh, third, well, when we think to Uber and Airbnb, the situation is of a certain type. But shared economy means also the delivery of food by bicycle that in certain situations resemble more to kamikaze jobs than to uh, decent jobs. So this is for me the threat. The type of jobs in certain cases is not guaranteed for being an high quality job. Okay, Robin, you raised your hand. Yep, so that may be difficult. I'm gonna actually spin it around and say uh, what types of opportunities there are for humans going forward as we embrace technology. And uh, I think basically there are tons of areas. If we look at our habitual routines of when we wake up in the morning to when we go to sleep, every single interaction you could think of from making your coffee to having your groceries delivered to taking a car to work to having your kids picked up from school to cooking dinner, all of that is actually subject to some sort of uh, shared economy opportunity. So I actually would spin it around. I think there are some risks, but I do think with emergence of shared economy companies, there are actually quite a few more opportunities. Fantastic. Robert, you have the last opportunity. Who gets fired, who stays? <laughs> well, I think um, everybody gets a job. It's just that you have to be always uh, learning, all right, to be relevant. I think it's very important for us to have that kind of mindset. Whether it's shared economy or something else in the next 10, 20 years that will come in, it's about preparedness of your workforce, right? How does governments, how does people like us in, in, in our own responsibility ensure that our workforce is always continuously learning and upgrading themselves? Give you an example, for example, in terms of what we are trying to do in Singapore. I think we have a concern in terms of how our people are being trained. Just now we talked about higher education. I think George mentioned higher education, but I think the way that we should be looking at is not just higher education, but having people to be wanting to be educated or to be trained right, continuously, what we call lifelong learning. And in that aspect, then you're preparing for future because it is very different today, next 50 years, compared to what it was last 50 years because uncertainties, innovation is pervasive and you have a lot of new things coming on. How will you react? What kind of job do you train yourself for now? You think you'll be relevant in 10 years, 20 years? So I think this is very important, how we prepare the workforce to be able to do that. And uh, the way to do that is mindset. The way to do that is also look at how we can entrench education together with a real society. So a lot of education is very uh, academic, I would say. And then you will be trained. And sometimes you predict that the job will happen. You train a couple of thousand jobs, but 
that, that industry then becomes something different, disrupted by shared economy or any other thing. So what do you do? I think it's very important for businesses, for education, for government to engage what we call the businesses. All right? So if they write businesses, you know what is relevant, you train your people to be relevant for that, but, and yet they're prepared to continuously learn. All right? So what we call skill-based training. Skill-based training, I think, is one of the key ways to go. So don't let everybody just chase academic paper, but you go skill-based learning, and lifelong learning will take you to wherever you want to go. That means the pathway is not just your end, it's actually when you finish university. No, no. Your beginning is actually when you actually come to work, and that's the beginning of a learning journey. So these are the kind of things that I think we have to change mindset, to be very prepared. Right? So I don't think I answer you fully, but this is really what it to, to be done, to be preparing so that people are ready for this kind of a innovation, which is going to be very pervasive. Yeah. So we, we are now at the closing stages in terms of a few minutes left. Um, as promised, I'm going to open up to the audience uh, for you to ask maybe three questions very quickly. Um, you know, Put up your hand, please introduce yourself, and if you're directive in terms of who you want to ask, happy to basically just point the right direction. Uh, the lady in the center. Please state your name, where you're from, and your question, please. Hi, I'm Kyla Christie. I'm from Indonesia, and I'm 17. Uh, I would like to speak for my generation through this question. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, how, do this, how does this new, pos the possibility of a shared economy actually not only aid existing small to medium enterprises, but actually help to spur new and young entrepreneurs such as myself to enter into the business world or to open their own businesses? Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, I'm a millennial. I want to answer that question, but I'm a moderator, so I cannot. Uh, let me ask the older folks over here. <laughs> um, yeah, who would be game enough to answer a 17-year-old aspiring to be an entrepreneur? Robin, I think you should. Okay. Yeah. I won't say if I'm a millennial or not. Uh, so first of all, thank you for your question. So this is exciting for you because the sky is the limit for millennials. And I'll tell you why. From the Airbnb perspective, we are seeing the emergence of such creative companies and partnerships. I can't even begin to tell you how many partners will approach me each day to talk about their ideas. We have everything from someone wanting to provide Airbnb for pets while you use Airbnb, to someone who wants to make your breakfast while you go to air, stay in an Airbnb, to people who want to babysit your children while you stay in an Airbnb. So there's an incredible opportunity for different and unique ideas, and those are just the normal ones that you'd probably would think of. And your advantage here is that millennials are the target sector for so many different companies, existing companies. You know better what your preferences and needs are. Your ability to consume media and to consume information in such a rapid way is going to be your advantage compared to many other generations. And the other thing is that you can also prepare for the next generation, which is Gen Z, and they are consuming media at even a faster rate. So you're going to have the advantage of bridging the gap between the generations while also knowing what you need. Um, so I think the sky's the limit for you. Thank you. Uh, second question. Uh, the gentleman at the second row, followed by the gentleman then at the back. Thank you. I'm, I'm Jun Pala Fox, architect from the Philippines. Um, Can you speak out? We can't hear you. Yeah. I'm Jun Pala Fox. I'm an architect from the Philippines. Okay. And will shared economy, how can we learn from Brexit and Catalonia? And second question, can, I think it will help corruption mapping locating which local governments are more corrupt than the others. And ASEAN, in ASEAN, the 10 countries, there will probably be real, not absolute comparison, but comparisons in relative terms. So some will be disadvantaged and advantaged, just like your Airbnb, which is more affordable, more, more competent, and so on. Thank you for that question. So uh, there are two parts of the question. One is Brexit. How does that impact the shared economy. Mario, perhaps you can take that. Robert, may you answer on corruption? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think that when you have uh, an area that is more and more integrated um, in terms of monetary policies or in terms of uh, trade, for example, uh, we economists, we hope that productivity would have converged and so the condition of living in many, in many situations. 
Now, there are areas, and you mentioned in both cases the European uh, area, where in reality productivity did not converge. And as a consequence, you had the situation in which you belong to the same community, but the sense of belonging was not necessarily as strong. This was somehow in the mind of those in charge of uh, public policy. For example, in the 80s, the European Commission elaborated a fund that is called the uh, Cohesion Fund, whose objective is to give money to regions in order to catch up when their level of income is particularly low. What was the objective? First of all, the objective was that all citizens are equal within a union, and therefore they might have equity uh, concerns and addresses. The second was uh, political stability and cohesion. If you have conditions that are so different, then the tension to explode the community that you have created risks to appear. And in fact, this has been the case with Brexit and with Catalonia. So in a certain sense, in the discussion that we are having here, that is not how much integration is helpful or should be done, the point is, if we do not guarantee that the access to these new technology and possibilities is well distributed, which does not mean equal, but uh, at least the opportunities are well distributed, then we risk to see those type of tension. For the fact that you have in Singapore 81% of population connected, but this is not the case of Cambodia. And therefore, or for the fact that you have large firms that are capable to develop fast and small firms that are not capable to catch up. Also, the point of technology of, of new firms. In many cases, we see that there are a lot of young entrepreneurs, but an important percentage of these entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs by necessity not by choice, because they are looking for a job they don't find, and therefore they start up a firm. How do we accompany those small firms? Not with money. Very often it's with services, information, uh, training. How do we do so that we do not create so dis uh, big disparities that engender tragic phenomena as the one that you have described? Thank you. Robert? Okay. Uh, there are various uh, definitions of corruption. I think uh, corruption means under the table to some people. It means over the table to others. It means incurring the table to many. So, <laughs> so there are three types of corruption. But uh, seriously, I think um, corruption, I think, is... Uh, I would say in any kind of a growing economy, some form of corruption, or I would say facilitation, money, whatever it is, is probably there. Right. Very difficult for you to eradicate it totally. But the way that we are moving forward in terms of the new shared economy, the major contributor to success right, is not how you do it, but it's about how you actually put a platform that can innovatively disrupt and create better lives for the rest. So I think it's very important. So if that becomes the preamble of whatever you think, corruption money is very hard to order because at the end of the day, it has to be delivered. Right? It has to be a basis for a lot of innovation to happen, and it has to benefit many, many people. Right? It's not benefiting a few. So I think that kind of a situation will actually make corruption less, uh, less uh, pervasive, and then allow things to move on basically on its own merit, right? in terms of what it can deliver as a good ultimately for the society and for people as a whole. Yeah. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That ends our session. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please, you know, uh, Put your hands together and show appreciation for the panelists. Thank you.